Our scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you all. If you are visiting with us and you've gotten one of those visitor's packets, if you will pass your attendance card toward the aisle at this time, we'll have an opportunity to pick that up. We'll have an opportunity to have a record of your attendance. And we're so grateful that you have decided to be here with us. How many of you put on about five or six pounds this week? I think I did too. It was a wonderful time to be with family. It's always a wonderful time. I don't know if I've told y'all how much I love Thanksgiving and turkey, but it's always a fun time to be there. It's even more special when you and I have the opportunity to be with the Lord's family, and we have that opportunity at least every Sunday. Hopefully, we get a chance to uh, see each other throughout the week and strengthen those bonds. This morning, I'd like to preach a sermon that I probably need to hear, maybe one that you do too. Here's what we've gotten good at in the church over the past few years. James 1, verse number 25, would warn us of these things, and yet we haven't heeded that warning as much. What we like to do is open that book of Acts when we're in a Bible class, and we like to tear those words apart. We like to find every single nuance of those words, and we like to be very educated on what that first century church did. And then we like to put our Bible down and walk away from it. James would tell us to be cautious of being hearers of the word and not doers of the work. We like to be very educated about the Bible, but the Bible without application does us no good. It absolutely does not any, any good with the exception of filling our mind with what God would say, but not filling our life with what God would have us do. Isn't it about time? Isn't it about time that we took those words and, and those accounts that we read about throughout the New Testament and, and we do something with them? Isn't it about time we got busy with the work of what God would tell us to do instead of what we occupy ourselves with? Over the next few moments, I'd like you to notice a few examples through the New Testament, and hopefully we can apply those things to our lives. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. What you'll find there in Matthew chapter 14 are the disciples, those hand-picked 12 of Jesus going across the Sea of Galilee. And they are going to meet up with Jesus on the other side. And as he is off praying, their storm blows up onto the boat or onto the lake on, in the boat where they are. The, the boat is in the lake. The storm is coming up the lake. Does that confuse you completely on that? And they're scared to death. They don't know which way to turn. Most of these men, or some of them at least, have had experience in boats on this lake with storms. And these guys are scared. That ought to let you know how difficult of a storm this is going to be. Jesus would walk past them. Don't lose sight of that idea. Just walk right past them. And say, be of good cheer as I be not afraid. To which Peter, the one that we often so much put on him as the, the, the very brash one, the one who speaks out um, probably more than he should. He says, if it's you, command me, which is an interesting study in and of itself, command me to come where you are. And Jesus said, come on. Peter finds himself stepping out of that boat onto that water. Think, think of this. Understand this fact. Peter, walking on this water, which he did, 
now finds himself as the only human in history ever to be able to say, I walked on water. I've walked through water several times. I've never walked on water. Walked on ice a couple of times that, that was crusted over a lake, but that doesn't count. He's walking on water. And the Bible would tell us there that if you read the King James Version that he begins to sink. If you'll read a, a little further and a, and a little deeper into that, what you'll find out is he's beginning the drowning process when Jesus lifts him out of the water. You say, I, I've studied that one all my life, preacher. What am I supposed to learn? You know, there are 11 other guys who stayed real dry. Why didn't they get out of the boat? You want to learn a lesson from Matthew 14? Get out of the boat. You have to meet people where they are. I'm going to have to meet people where they are. Well, God said, yeah, well, you're going to have to meet them there, yes. The fact is they can't stay there, sure, but somebody's going to have to meet them somewhere, aren't they? Do you fully expect for them just to walk through that door? Brethren, if, if we fully expect that, let, let me say this to you. As nicely as I can say this, you are living in a fantasy world. If you think they're coming in here without having some sort of relationship with somebody in here, you're living a dream. You and I have to get out of the boat. We have to do what Jesus said, carry that light to a dark world. You, need a, you know what a lesson that I need to learn? Get out of the boat. Notice Mark chapter 10. Luke, when you went to school, did they have shirt class there? They didn't have shirt class when I went, but luckily uh, we have a few here who helped me out with that, and I sure do appreciate that. We're very conscious on what our youth shirts and our youth day shirts and our camp shirts what they say you want to learn the lesson from mark chapter 10 here it is forget about t-shirts jesus said in mark chapter 10 verse number 45 i came to minister and not to be ministered and to give my life for many boy that looked great on a shirt we came to serve and not to be served that'd be a great youth shirt wouldn't it well, he's put to the test in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through the end of the chapter. He walks out of the, 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 the room where he is, and he's confronted with a blind guy who begins to scream at him, Son of David! To which the disciples say, He didn't have time for you. Leave Jesus alone. He's got other things to do. He calls him out one more time by name. And then in an interesting idea in Mark chapter 10, you have Jesus turn to this blind man and give all of his attention to that one person. Every bit of it, everyone else around him melted away. It's simply Bartimaeus and Jesus at this point. Hmm. Can you imagine having the entire attention of the Son of God? And your eyes don't even work good enough to see it? Well, Jesus is in a dilemma at this point. Either he meant what he said or he didn't. Either he was going to serve this blind man or he was going to walk away from him like everybody else and not do a thing to help him. So what's he going to do? Either Jesus was concerned about T-shirts or not. What's he going to do? You and I know from this account that Jesus looks at him, asks him what he would do, and gives him his sight. You know what the lesson I need to learn is? Forget about T-shirts. Forget about T-shirts. Do something. Find a way to serve. 
Well, I can't do what you do. Well, nobody said you had to do what I do. I didn't say find a way to be a preacher somewhere. Mark chapter 10 would remind us all, find a place to serve. It is so vital to the kingdom of God that there be servants, that there be those who would serve after the master and in the same capacity in which he did, those who would look at those who need help and meet those needs. Get out of the boat. Forget about shirts. Matthew chapter 14. Do you have little cheater notes in, in your Bible up above where the text is, where uh, in those chapters it might tell you what's going to happen within that chapter. If you do, I like them. If you do, perhaps yours says something to the effect of Jesus feeds the multitude or, or Jesus feeds 5,000. Is that what yours says? Yes, shake or nod. It's okay. That's wrong. Jesus doesn't feed anybody in Matthew chapter 14. Not one soul does he feed. Jesus perform a miracle? Yes. Does Jesus provide a meal for the multitude that's there? Absolutely. But he puts the task of passing baskets on the disciples. If they don't feed this crowd, the crowd walks away hungry. You want to learn lesson number three? Here it is. Billy, here we go. You are not too good to pick up a basket. Just not. Have you seen or heard the statement as it would go through even the church or perhaps even where you work? Oh, that's not my job. Mm. While that might work, in an employment setting that never can work in the church. That everything is my job. Interestingly, everything's your job too. Next week, as I use my powers of seeing into the future, Michael's going to be violently sick. So is Billy, uh, who preaches. Who teaches class? Well, we hadn't thought about that. Are you prepared if you had to? And see, the fact of the matter is, Michael and Billy live in physical bodies where that could very well happen. And there's nothing extremely special about us that we are the only two gifted who can speak. A lot of times we look at jobs throughout the kingdom of Christ and we say, well, that just ain't my job. <laughs> Why not? Well, I don't lead singing as well as Nathan. Can you? I didn't ask you who you did it as well as. If we don't learn to pick up a basket, the church is doomed. Get out of the boat. Stop thinking about shirts. Pick up a basket and wash a foot. John 13. When you pick up with John chapter 13, uh, there's a little bit of a controversy in the way it begins with its translation. Some would say, Supper being concluded, others would say in the middle of supper, regardless of the time. Here's what happens. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, notices a simple task that should have been done was not completed. And so what he does... As he comes down from that table and takes off his coat. And he girds himself with a towel, puts a towel around his waist, and bends down 
at those hand-picked disciples' feet and begins to wash their feet. It would have been a task for the smallest, the lowliest servant that would have been there. And yet, here is the one who created feet, washing feet. Now, I don't know everything that I know, but I do know this. I'm not sure whose time it was to wash those feet. But I am sure of whose time it was not. You're telling me it was not the Son of God? That's exactly what I'm telling you. You're telling me it wasn't Jesus' time to wash those feet? That's exactly what I'm telling you. It would come to Peter, and Peter would say, don't wash my, don't wash my feet, Jesus. And we can see the humility there that Peter would say, I'm not, not worthy to, for you to wash my feet because of who you are. And yet, Peter's still sitting where he is, not washing anybody's feet. And then Jesus would say, unless I wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. He said, well, then wash everything I have. And he said, you don't get it, Peter. You're not understanding what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. Unless you become like servants. Unless you find somebody's feet to wash. You can never have part of the kingdom. Get out of the boat. Forget about t-shirts. Pass a basket and wash a foot. This is more uh, intimate than just passing a basket. Those type things would be uh, tasks we have for those on the outside. This washing feet would be more an intimate setting with those who were inside the church. Is there anybody hurting? No, not within church, right? No, nobody is. You don't think Mark's family is? Wash a foot. Find somewhere to help. Notice Luke chapter 15. One year, uh, Cliff Goodwin and I were tasked with teaching at the Bremen Church of Christ. And they assigned us topics. And he got the, the uh, parable of the two sons. Of course he did. And they told me, we want you to preach on Luke 15. Everybody was uh, doing Luke 15 that day. And I had the first few verses, 4 through 7. And in my mind, what I thought was, if I ever get to Luke 15, I'm going to them two boys. That's where I'm comfortable. That's where I'm headed. And so I was kind of bouncing it off a cliff what was going on. He said, hey, that's not your topic. That's my topic. Which I thought was a little, I thought if I go first, I can steal your topic. I thought that was a little, little greedy of him. And he forced me to preach on Luke 15, seven through, or nine, 4 through 7. Forced me. And what I found there in Luke chapter 15 is probably the greatest section of Scripture Jesus ever spoke on the way the church grows. You have a shepherd has a hundred sheep. We can, we can deal, I can deal because I'm very elementary in math. I can deal with hundreds. I got hundred. I know what a hundred is. And this shepherd loses one of them. He pins up those 99, and then he goes out looking for that one. And in my estimation of never being a shepherd, for a long time I considered that action foolish. You got 99. Be happy with what you got. I don't know how many are on the roll 
of the congregation here. I don't, I don't know. Think we could seat them all if they all came? Or we'd have to pull in a chair or two. I'm not sure we could seat 99% of them. It all felt very foolish to me until I was the one. Then it made perfect sense. You want to apply the scripture? You want to do something that God would say? Find the one. Find the one. What we generally do here in this pen is we take care of the 99 who are here. Well, where's the one? It's all well and good that we have the 99, but where's the one? Jesus is so very selfish here. Notice what he says. I know I have those 99, but I want that other one too. <laughs> I want the other one too. Like I said, it only makes sense if as you look around, you find yourself completely lost. And you think, is that the voice of the shepherd I hear? Everybody sitting and looking at me has a mental picture or a name of the one, don't you? Shake or not. Then go get the one. Go. Here are the facts. They very well could be defensive against those eight men who hold the eldership positions here at this congregation. They very well, that one who's lost, may not want to hear from them, may not want to hear what they have to say, but they might listen to you. Are you still responsible? Get out of the boat. Forget about shirts and pass a basket and clean a foot and go get that one. And build an ark while you're there. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about Genesis chapter 6. But what you read about Noah at the, the beginning part of Genesis chapter 6 is this. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I don't have any previous knowledge of his carpentry skills from before then. But I can tell you this, at the end of Genesis chapter 9, he is the world's premier shipbuilder. Of course, he's the only one alive. Matt, guess what? I wouldn't have any idea where to start building a boat. I don't know. Maybe I would. Maybe I'd go to Matt's house or Tim's house and go, I don't know what I'm doing. What if God asked me to build a boat? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> you want to learn a lesson from Genesis chapter 6? Do what God says, even if you think you can't, because He knows you can. He knows you can. Oh, well, I don't think I can. Well, God thinks you can. Well, I don't know about that. Well, God does. I don't know if it'll float. God knows it will, if you follow these instructions. Well, the world doesn't like it. Christian, let me say something to you. And I'd like for you to chew on this and ponder this for a while and see, see if there's any truth in it. As a Christian, if the world in general really likes you, something's wrong. Get out of the boat and build a boat.
What God asks is not so hard that we cannot do it. Although it might seem so difficult to us that we can't. It is possible. A little hard work, a little faith. There you go. But Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, notice this last one. You'll meet up with a man whose name is Ananias. No, it's not. Yeah, Ananias and Sapphira. Is that right? Somebody shake or nod. Somebody. Give it to me, Luke. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Some reason I had Aquila and Priscilla running through there, and I knew that wasn't right. You have a man named Ananias and Sapphira, and by uh, all intents and purposes, as we're looking out, watching what they did on that day, as they give that sum of money to those apostles, it would have been awe-inspiring. And I'm, I'm going to have to admit this. More than likely, I would have been really impressed by that. And I would have said to, said to myself, I can't do that. I can't give that. But I'm so glad for them that they could. I probably would have gone up and hugged their necks and said, thank you for that gift for the kingdom. I know it will be used well. Now, that's from the outside looking in. You want to learn this lesson? Here it is. Be impressed with the things that impresses God. Was he impressed with Ananias and Sapphira? Oh, no. Did he see them and say, that's what I hope everyone in the church does? Oh, no. Be impressed with the things that impress God. What are you trying to tell us, preacher? I'm trying to tell you this. If we never take the information from those pages and we never apply it into a good working relationship with God, we haven't done anything. We've wasted a bunch of time, wasted a bunch of effort, wasted a bunch of money. But at the point we began to take the Word of God and then to apply that into our lives, then we've gained everything. Then we have gained the glory and the riches and the majesty of God Himself. And until we do that, we won't, won't gain a thing. It's easily looked at when you and I start looking at God's plan of salvation. Do you know what it says? I'm sure you do. You probably heard it three times a week from the same type of mouths. You've heard those same scriptures. You've heard that man has to hear, and he does, Romans 10, 17. You hear that man has to believe, and he does, John 8, verse 24. You've heard that a man has to repent, and he does, Luke 13, 3 and 5. You heard that a man has to confess that Jesus is the Christ, and he does, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. And you've heard that man has to be baptized in water for the remission of his sins, and he does, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 you've heard those and heard those and heard those and heard those but have you applied it because until you apply it you are still L O S T and you've heard time after time after time, that man must be faithful unto God, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. And that's true. But until you apply that, you're still lost. Until we take God's Word at its value, and until we begin to embrace that, and until we apply those things in our lives, we are sitting here doing nothing but being lost. Here's the good news. Don't leave here saying, well, Billy just wore us out. Here's the good news. Are you ready? You don't have to stay that way. 
You don't have to stay in that same condition. You can come to God now. You don't have to waste another second there. You can leave this building knowing full well, inside and out, that you have done what God says, you applied those things to your life, and God loves you and will give you a home in heaven. But it's up to what you're going to decide in the next few moments while we stand and while we sing.